Uh, my name is James. I am a former student of Nathan's uh, at SOAS, where I just finished my MA. Um, I will soon become a research assistant on the Han project. Um, and uh, during my time as an MA student, uh, and also throughout my dissertation project, I worked on uh, the project that I will present today, uh, which is Shisheng imputation. So uh, in, in a broad sense, uh, this is basically a method for filling in rhyme gaps uh, when they're not attested in the actual poetic corpus using uh, a sort of naive edge filling uh, method based on phonetic series, uh, which I'll explain later. Basically, for this presentation, we're going to start just by broadly talking about what has been done before uh, in a similar area or uh, with applications to this corpus or similar corpora. Um, I will then introduce the idea of applying graph theory to rhymes and what a rhyme network actually turns out to be. Um, I'll then describe my uh, method for why I, or, or my method for measuring cluster quality, which turns out to be kind of the, the most important quantitative metric for studying uh, the, I guess, quality of rhyme annotations that I'm comparing in this particular project. Um, then uh, I will describe uh, the Shisheng hypothesis, although I'm sure probably most of the people in the audience already know what that is, um, and how exactly it applies to the construction of rhyme networks. Um, I'll then introduce uh, with particular view to velar final characters what that actually ends up looking like uh, and what kinds of new things are result from comparing these different rhyme annotations. So in this instance, uh, I've mainly compared the rhyme annotations of William Baxter and Wang Li. Baxter from his 1992 book and Wang Li from his uh, 1980 book. Uh, and for reconstructions, I have used both Wang Li's reconstructions from his simultaneous 1980 publication uh, and also uh, the new reconstruction of old Chinese from Baxter and Sagar with, uh, in some cases, when a character did not uh, or was not reconstructed in the 2014 volume uh, to Zhengzheng Shangfeng with the necessary sort of mutations made in order to make it Baxter Cigar compliant. Um, and then that'll be it. So uh, for our sources, uh, my project was entirely based on the Shu Jing. Um, so I didn't at this point uh, consult any other uh, old Chinese corpora. Um, and like I said before, uh, I used rhyme annotations by Wang Li and William Baxter. Uh, and then the reconstructions primarily for the Baxter rhyme annotations came from the newest publication or came from OCNR, which is Old Chinese and New Reconstruction, um, Baxter and Cigar 2014. Uh, and then if there was a character that was not reconstructed in Baxter and Cigar 2014, then I would mutate a character from Zheng Zhang Changfeng's 2003 book uh, in order to make it Baxter and Cigar compliant. Um, Wang Li's annotations are actually complete. Every rhyming character in the Shi Jing has been reconstructed by Wang Li, uh, not necessarily with you know, complete reliability, but uh, it is enough to create a fully, uh, a fully colored rhyme graph. And you'll see what that means later on. Uh, so just as a, an example, um, in case you're not familiar with these two reconstruction paradigms, this is an example of what uh, some different or, or actually, you know, sets of many of the same characters are reconstructed and are and how they're reconstructed differently in these two systems. Um, so more or less in the first instance, the strings I'm working with are the reconstructions that are shown here on the uh, right hand side of either column of characters. Um, this isn't that important, but it's just sort of to guide you in the direction of knowing what the different reconstructions will look like. Um, I think that's just something helpful to remember going forward. So for our data structures, um, originally these are all just text-based CSV files, but uh, you can transform them into more uh, machine or, or more human readable uh, formats. Uh, but 
as a general principle, the data structure at its base looks more or less like this um, before I did any transformations or extracted anything from it. Um, so you see a poem title here, a stanza. These are all, again, from the Shijing. Um Rhyme word, rhyme, and reconstruction are the main things that this that uh, my analysis would focus on. Even rhyme actually isn't that important. Um, but rhyme word just indicates the character that rhymes in the line. Uh, and then reconstruction is the reconstruction of that rhyme word. Uh, in this case, this is uh, a Wang Li set. Um, there's a the these sets have been compiled uh, primarily by the team out of um, the Max Planck Institute. Uh, so I um, have analyzed these data, but I, I should specifically say that uh, I can't take credit for compiling them. And that's a much more sort of uh, tedious job. So I appreciate someone else doing that. Um, so that brings us, I guess, to the question of what actually is a network. So if you've read any of the papers that um, Nathan has been working on for the last couple of years, or particularly on Matis List has been working on, then you'll know. But otherwise, uh, a network is an abstract mathematical object, or a, technically a graph is an abstract mathematical object uh, that represents entities and relationships between them. Um, those relationships are also abstractions. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't assert anything about what those specific relationship is like. All you're saying is uh, A is connected to B in some meaningful way. So A is a node, B is a node. I'm connecting A and B uh, because I, I, I assert that they are related in some way. Um, much of the time, these have uh, sort of baked in relationships. So you can most commonly create graphs of uh, flight paths uh, between airports or social networks based on friend or follower relationships on social media or something. Um, but in, in poetry, you can do the same thing by connecting characters that rhyme with each other. And so that's effectively what a rhyme network is. Um, so in the case of a rhyme network, you just create an abstraction over the corpus, and then you can slice it to get a finer grain view of whatever it is that you're interested in looking at. Um, so here's a more concrete example. Uh, this is the first stanza of the first poem of the Shi Jing. Um, we have, and, and this is what a self-contained rhyme network would look like for this poem. So we see here that the characters at the ends of lines one, two, and four all rhyme with each other. Um, which creates this triangular network where each character is connected to all the other ones. Um, in graph theoretic terms, that means it's fully connected, uh, where every node connects to every other possible node. Um, and then in this case, uh, this one goes out on its own. Uh, in the networks that I built, uh, I would generally ignore singleton characters unless they happen to rhyme with themselves in a poem. So not that they appeared by themselves, but that they appeared in rhyming position only with themselves, in which case they would be um, put out to pasture kind of like this. Uh, but in cases where they uh, only appeared once, uh, in other words, I guess, kind of a, a, a hapax, in the hapax legomena of the Shujin, I would algorithmically ignore them um, just because it cleans up the graph quite a lot. And then for the sake of measuring the quality of partitions, in other words, uh, when you create a rhyme network, you expect characters to group together in some meaningful way. Uh, in our case, we hope that characters will group together uh, by their first by their finals and by their nuclear vowels. So in other words, characters that have the same final and nuclear vowel will create more well-defined clusters uh, and that the number of vowels in a reconstruction more or less should correspond to the number of clusters that you find if you slice a graph by its final or by the final of the characters or by characters who have a final in the graph that you're looking at. Um, so. To do this, we use a metric called modularity. Uh, modularity is uh, a statistical measure of cluster quality. Um, and it is uh, just the difference between the actual number of edges versus the expected edges in a predefined subgraph. More specifically, if you take a graph and you cut out a piece of it, uh, it measures the number of edges 
within the graph compared to the number of edges leaving, excuse me, within the subgraph compared to the number of edges leaving the subgraph, uh, and then subtracts that from the expected number in the same way that you would derive an expectation for a chi-square test or something. Um, so this is the formula. Uh, I could tell you what all the pieces mean, um, but it's it, that level of granularity I don't think is that important. Um, so there are some issues with using this metric uh, that I definitely should declare ahead of time. Uh, so one of them is that calculating maximum modularity for a graph is NP hard. Uh, in practical terms, if, if you don't have a, you know, if you don't have like an intermediate CS background or something, uh, if something is NP hard, that effectively means that there's no kind of uh, algorithmic shortcut for solving this problem. If you want, more or less, if you want to calculate maximum modularity, you have to calculate every possible partition of a graph and then measure that uh, and sort it in the long list of partitions. Uh, so in a partition, for example, if we go back to this one, one such partition might be uh, only the blue one and then the three orange ones. Okay, that's fine. But then it could also be considering all four nodes as entirely separate uh, and then measuring modularity for that or considering two orange nodes as one partition and then uh, the blue and the remaining orange node as another partition or separating the other blue and the orange node. So you can see that as you add more nodes to a graph, uh, the number of partitions increases uh, not quite exponentially, uh, but it goes up really fast. So uh, if you have three, uh, then you have six possible partitions. If you have 100 nodes, then you have 98 million partitions approximately. And then beyond that is even more. Uh, so that means that any algorithm that calculates modularity doesn't calculate definitely the maximum modularity. It uses some kind of heuristic to uh, start calculating modularities and then walk back when it feels like it's not getting anything more out of it, um, which is the case with the algorithm that I decided to use, which is the closet newman moore algorithm. Uh, effectively, this one works by partitioning the graph first uh, with all of its nodes being separate uh, communities and then merging them together piece by piece until it arrives at uh, some kind of stable convergence of maximum modularity. Um, but because it starts with a high number of communities and then shrinks that number, if, for example, you know you have say 200 nodes in a graph uh, and it finds maybe 10 or 12 communities, and then it goes to nine and eight and seven, and it doesn't see the maximum modularity going up, then it will walk back. But it may be the case still that maybe six or five communities uh, is a better partition if you have an a priori reason for partitioning the graph that way. Um, on the other hand, uh, other modularity calculations are significantly more computationally intensive. Uh, and so uh, this is generally considered kind of the current standard. Now, uh, with respect to the Shaysheng hypothesis, I'm guessing most, if not all, the people here know what that is. But if you don't, um, Chinese characters are composed of, or compound Chinese characters are composed of phonetic and semantic radicals. Um, you can sort characters by their phonetic radicals. Uh, and later on, you know, through the uh, development of um, first from Karlgren and then from Li Feng Kui, uh, we have these things called phonetic series where characters are put in groups based on uh, the combination of their phonetic radical and at this point, the, also um, the uh, place of articulation of their initial consonants, or, you know, if they don't, also if they don't have one. Um, so, the uh, Shisheng hypothesis uh, in, is most commonly articulated by this quote from Li Fang Kui's 1975 book, which is uh, the same phonetic determiner in the writing of two characters implies the words expressed by these characters have the same rhyme category in the odes. Uh, in other words, even if we don't have an attestation of two characters rhyming, if they did occur together in rhyming position in an old Chinese corpus, they would have rhymed. Um, 
So if we can encode Shishin relationships as rhymes, we can draw edges between nodes that do not have edges if we only draw a rhyme network of the corpus. Uh, and this will hopefully resolve our singleton node problem to some extent. Uh, so then the question, I suppose, is does it? Um, so in order to do that, we also have to make a couple of assumptions. Uh, so one of them is the ability for two old Chinese characters to rhyme is correlated with both the nuclear vowel and the final. Um, this, I suppose, makes sense, but it should still be clarified as an assumption since ultimately a rhyme is not a, a fixed quality of language, but a sort of arbitrary uh, linguistic feature. Um, next assumption based on the Shisheng hypothesis is that characters within the same Shisheng series will share their nuclear vowel, including cases of phonophoric nesting. So uh, in a Shisheng series, you might find that the base character generates a character, and then that character is then used as the phonetic determiner for another character, um, which uh, you can see here where we have um, the character in the center of this spoke on the left being used for as the as the phonetic determiner for the character in the and the, as which is the hub for the spokes on the right and then that character is then used as the phonetic determiner for all of the characters on the outer ring so what we're assuming in this case is uh naively but uh, for statistical purposes effectively that um, all of these would have rhymed with each other if they had occurred in rhyming position in an old Chinese corpus. Um, so, and then we have this last one, which is uh, when a poet is forced to slant rhyme, sharing vowels is preferable to finals, although this doesn't end up affecting the structure of the rhyme network very much um, because we don't end up comparing different finals. Uh, we only end up comparing uh, finals and then uh, looking at the distribution of vowels within slices final character final slices of the graphs. Um, and then measuring the modularity of vowel subgraphs within the final sliced subgraphs of what you can think of as an abstract graph of the whole poetic corpus. Uh, so how actually did we do this? Well, in our original data structure, we have romanized reconstructions. Uh, so we can extract the nuclear vowel from these reconstructions using a regular expression. Um, specifically, uh, you so if in one of these reconstructions, for example, uh, we do find quite often that a reconstruction will end with uh, a letter I or a letter U. And so that has to be first transformed into a J or a W then the string is reversed and the first vowel that we come across, we consider to be the nuclear vowel. Um, same thing with Baxter and Cigar reconstructions, although those have a lot more white space, uh, sort of superfluous white space, so it's a little bit more complex. Um, but if you, again, reverse those strings, take out all the white space, uh, ignore the super segmentals, then in theory, the first vowel you come across should be the nuclear vowel. So, if you manage to do this, uh, you can just create or we created another column that represents the vowel for the character. Um, then we created dictionaries, uh, digital uh, dictionaries as in associated arrays, not um, you know lexicographic dictionaries uh, that mapped characters to their reconstructions uh, and also characters to their vowels uh, for each of the Wangli and the Baxter slash OCNR reconstructions. Uh, and rhyme annotations. Then uh, following that, we build a large rhyme network from all the Shisheng series, um, irrespective of any corpus data. Uh, we filter the rhyme annotations to draw a network only of characters with the same reconstructed coda. Then following that, we overlay the two graphs, the Shisheng graph and the final filtered graph. Uh, and then remove any characters that are part of Xixing series, but that are not part of the original coda filtered character set, and then do the evaluation metrics. That was a lot kind of fast. So uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? No? OK, move on. Um, so as an example, as, as just a proof of concept, we'll start with final M, because final M is pretty rare. Uh, in the corpus, and so it generates a fairly small graph that's easy to sort of look at and evaluate. Uh, so here's OCNR final M characters. Uh, you can see that floating around the edge 
are lots of pairs or small groups that don't connect to the main group very much. And uh, while this is good for showing us which characters are actually tested to rhyme with each other, this is not that useful in showing us uh, what exactly the structure of the rhymes in a sort of fully connected world would be like. Um, and then this is the structure of our sort of final graphs. Uh, so in this case, the nodes are colored by their core vowel. Um, I have the key somewhere, uh, but I don't think it's that important right now. Um, the important thing is, uh, as you can see, that this central, that a couple of bigger hubs are surrounded by lots of small pairs uh, uh, that should be connected to the main graph, hopefully, showing us that uh, final codas actually do cluster together, but at the moment they're not. Um, this is a graph of all Shizhong series, more or less. Um, you can't zoom in closely enough to pick one out because the basically it, it's too dense. You can't, uh, I, I couldn't show you a, a picture of the whole set and also tease out individual nodes. Although in some cases you can see singletons uh, kind of floating around the outside. Um, but uh, this mess actually will not affect the final graph very much because uh, in the next step, when we combine these two graphs, we will then prune all of the nodes in this graph that are not part of the, this original set of nodes. Uh, and we arrive here, which is much better. Um, so we have no more floating nodes. Uh, everything has been connected to something else by way of an edge. Uh, in a couple of cases, we have a node represented by a kind of uh, singleton vowel, a, a hapax vowel in the corpus, uh, which can't really be helped. Um, so it's not going to connect to its partners. Um, this one is not part of a Shaysheng series that would have connected it to any of these, but in the end, ultimately that that's also fine because we've um, massively cleaned up this graph. Um, in a graph that's this small and kind of easy to look at, calculating modularity, I don't think is that helpful because it's quite easy, I think, to just kind of, it, it, it passes the eye test more or less for showing that indeed uh, vowel plus final combinations do tend to cluster together. Um, and it doesn't show us anything particularly interesting about that, I don't think. Um, so on the other hand, uh, if we set these two reconstructions against each other and look at uh, final groups that are larger, uh, particularly the final ng and final k, so the final velar nasal and the final velar stop, um, and then we assign the additional attribute to be vowel, then we might actually see some interesting information that would allow us to evaluate the quality of these two reconstructions, whether Wangli or OCNR, Baxter and Cigar. Um, this was the hope. So initially what we expected was to be able to combine uh, a graph of Wang Li's rhyme annotations with uh, the Baxter and Cigar vowel reconstructions, uh, overlay them with each other and say, oh, look, it's you know worse or better or something like that, uh, just based on how it looks. Uh, it turns out that this actually doesn't work. Uh, because uh, while we strategically chose two reconstructions that are uh, pretty much as dramatically different from each other as possible, uh, that also means that the rhyme annotations of these two are also significantly different. Uh, significantly different enough that overlaying the vowels onto the rhyme annotations creates chaos rather than order. Um, I would say this is most apparent with the final ng graph. Um, with the final stop graph, uh, they're a little more similar, but they're still not similar enough, I think, to do direct comparison. Uh, it also raises quite a few complications in terms of evaluation, uh, because if you go into it, if, if you go into the analysis imagining that the reconstructions of uh, the latter day are going to be somehow better, uh, it turns out actually that you need quite a lot of quantitative evidence for that. Um, so this is OCNR's uh, unimputed graph of final ng. Um, as you can see, uh, there are quite a few small clusters around the outside, which is an undesirable characteristic. Um, at the same time, we have larger clusters in a lot of places, uh, which is 
mainly due to the fact that a lot of characters have final ng uh, in the corpus. We also see in this case, quite interestingly, the, uh, a lot of mixture between these lavender and orange nodes, uh, which is going to be kind of a repeating theme uh, in that uh, what we've stumbled on in this case is, is some kind of, um, it's, it's unclear whether it's, for example, a regional or a diachronic difference, but it, it, it is quite often the case that uh, in these graphs, you see hard partitions between certain vowel groups and uh, softer partitions between other vowel groups. Uh, so in this case, uh, the lavender and the orange represent um, ing and eng characters, I believe, as reconstructed. Uh, and it's quite intuitive, I think, uh, not surprising that in many cases, ing and eng would be uh, rhymable, particularly if a poet uh, puts himself in a situation where uh, he is only really able to use an eng character to rhyme with an ing character or something like that. It, 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 it is understandable that this would be an acceptable thing to do. Um, but uh, in this case, we do see that uh, it is something that did happen very frequently. Um, now, in order to fix these outlying characters, uh, we again impute. Uh, and it turns out that it actually makes it a lot better. So if you look at this uh, graph before, if you look kind of, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but if you look in the sort of center to top right, you see the one pink node uh, that sits among all of the blue ones. Um, and though, although it's not uh, a significantly undesirable characteristic for it to be sat among the blue nodes and separated from the pink ones, ideally we would be able to connect it to the rest of its uh, true vowel neighbors. And indeed, that does happen. Uh, in fact, it creates a bridge between the pink and the blue nodes. Um, the blue node uh, in the top center that is connected to the yellow nodes, uh, it doesn't join with the rest of them because it belongs to a series that otherwise does not contain final ng. Uh, we have a similar sort of situation with these two orange ones where uh, they are reconstructed in OCNR as final ng, but uh, the rest of their series have final ng, uh, so they do not connect with the rest of uh, the orange nodes. But having said that, if you look closely, you'll see that this character shares a phonetic determiner with this one. Uh, and so it is, it's actually, you know, with, with a bit of uh, qualitative appraisal, uh, it is, it becomes clear that an edge drawn between, for example, this character and this one is entirely a reasonable thing to do. Uh, just not something that the algorithm would be able to do heuristically. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, this uh, is a pretty good partition of this graph. So at this point, I think I should clarify that modularity requires two things to be set before you calculate it. So one of them is the structure of the graph is preset. So nodes, irrespective of any attributes, uh, doesn't matter what the character is, doesn't matter what the vowel is. Uh, it, modularity is, is entirely agnostic to any attributes about the nodes, it is. it only considers the graph as an abstract mathematical object. And so if you were to measure the modularity of this graph, it is only it is solely dependent on the structure and then the uh, communities that you predefine if you want to calculate it. Um, so in this case, you would have to say, or you would have to put all of the blue nodes in a set, all of the pink nodes in a set, lavender, orange, green, yellow. Uh, and then say, these are the communities calculate modularity. And then it will do the calculation for you. Um, you could do it by hand, but it would take an extremely long time. Uh, so then from OCNR, we get to Wang Li. And one of the things I think that's striking about this is the, the amount of actually internal structure that it has compared to OCNR. Um, so uh, it turns out actually that Wang Li's reconstructions were almost certainly already sensitive to Shizhen relationships, because if you impute or don't impute, they are virtually the same, uh, including the fact that there are no singletons. Uh, all it does is fill in additional edges within clusters. Uh, so uh, here we have only the Wang Li imputed graph, and here we see four quite neatly 
defined tight clusters, which correspond to the four vowels that Wangli's reconstructions believe uh, can precede final n, but there are still problems with that. So uh, one of those problems is the Wangli reconstruction is typologically odd uh, from a, you know, a, a cross-linguistic perspective, um, whereas the Baxter and Cigar reconstructions are definitely not. So in the Wangli reconstructions, uh, we find that of that there are four vowels of Wangli's seven reconstructed vowels that can precede final ng, uh, those being a, o, u, and uh, a, o, u, and a. But from those four, he excludes o. Um, and there is not actually a consistent phonological rule based on the rest of his reconstruction uh, that would seem to generate this possibility. Uh, at the same time, the amount of structure that is contained uh, within his rhyme graph suggests that there is some value to the, the amount that he, or to, there is some value to his rhyme annotations uh, because this is clearly a, a good structured graph. Um, again, this leads to a bit of a problem because uh, with any of these things, when we're comparing someone's rhyme annotations to their reconstructions, uh, it's possible to fall into the, uh, a trap of circular reasoning where uh, a particular reconstruction will subsequently inform rhyme annotations and then rhyme annotations will then begin to inform reconstructions until we arrive at some sort of convergence. Uh, so then we actually can also quantitatively appraise the quality of these partitions. So one thing about both of these is uh, modularity can also punish graphs for not having enough structure within their clusters. Um, and in fact, that is something that happens to Wangli. So if we measure cluster quality for these two graphs, uh, we find that OCNR's maximum modularity heuristically is calculated at 0.494, but the uh, even pre-imputed uh, OCNR final mm graph uh, arrives at a much better modularity than what could have been, uh, or than, than what the algorithm could provide. Um, and furthermore, uh, by with the addition of Shisheng edges, the modularity goes up even more, which is a good result. If Shisheng edges improve your modularity, that means that you've probably done something right and is, a, is one of the things that we were initially setting out to, uh, to test. Um, so where does that leave us? 0.536 and 0.542. Um, Wang Li's partition, uh, on the other hand, is a little bit worse than maximum modularity, but to an extent that is uh, effectively, uh, to, to an extent that is uh, effectively unimportant. Um, and then by adding Shisheng edges, uh, his actually goes up a lot more. So when I mentioned before that uh, the addition of Shisheng edges doesn't draw new edges between singleton characters, for example, but it does increase uh, the number of connections within structures. Uh, this is really important because uh, what you actually find is that modularity will punish hub and spoke network structures. Uh, compared to more tightly connected graphs. And so with the addition of Cheshang edges, uh, by creating more tightly connected clusters in each of these vowel groups, uh, we see Wang Li's modularity uh, for his vowel groups significantly increase. Uh, now, if we move on to final K, uh, with this one, uh, it is actually, this is just the inner part of the final K graph, but it would have been impossible to show you any kind of structure because there were too many uh, singletons and pairs floating around in a ring on the outside. I will also mention at this point, for those of you who are interested, uh, in order to draw these graphs, I used the spring layout. Uh, it's called the spring layout because um, the edges between nodes, in this case, are supposed to act like springs. Uh, which creates a uh, which creates tension between nodes, and the more 
cluster of nodes that is behind an edge, the tighter the distance will be. Um, and if a node is not connected to any other node, it will try to maximize its distance away from those nodes until an edge is drawn between them, uh, in which case it will pull it closer. Uh, there's a little more to it than that, but that's sort of a, a broadly impressionistic description of how it works. Um, so with OCNR final K, uh, there's a big outer cloud of characters that are not visible in this picture uh, that need to be imputed because uh, it's really that, that's really undesirable. Um, when you do impute, most of them go away, but you're still left with quite a few along the outside. Um, but the internal structure also becomes tighter. Um, in this case, we also see a few green characters here. These are characters that uh, neither Baxter nor Cheng Zhang Shangfang reconstructed, and so we we didn't have a uh, commutable source uh, to reconstruct for them. Um, that would be something to do maybe in the future. But uh, for the moment, it's OK, because if we want to calculate modularity, it's uh, acceptable to just ignore them and calculate modularity for the graph that does not contain the unreconstructed nodes. Um, if we move on to Wang Li's final k, uh, there in, in Wang Li's case with final k, uh, it is possible to proceed k with seven vowels uh, rather than just four, which is why we see seven colors here. Um, and they are quite substantially mixed together uh, in a way that is uh, quite in a way that is undesirable compared to final ng. So with the final k characters, this throws the internal structure evinced by this uh, kind of very uh, visually impressive uh, network into a question. Um, if we then combine Wang Li's final K unimputed graph with Shisheng, however, uh, we get something that is much more structured. Uh, so I, I, I've already explained a lot about graphs, so I, I won't dwell too much on this, but we do find a couple of interesting things. Uh, one of which is this group at the bottom, the blue and the lavender, uh, where we see that uh, in Wang Li's reconstructions, these are the ok and ak finals uh, cluster quite tightly together in a way that would seem to suggest that these were, in fact, a, uh, a combined rhyming group. Uh, now, because this graph and this graph, uh, at least with these central parts, are uh, closer in terms of vowel association compared to the NG graphs. Uh, what we do find if we combine Wang Li's structure with Baxter's vowels is something like this. So in this case, again, the, uh, the green characters do not have reconstructions in uh, Cheng Zhang Shangfang or in Baxter and Cigar, and so uh, when we calculate modularity, we can ignore them. But for now, it's important to pay attention to the characters that are not green. Uh, and what we see in this case is the uh, combination of uh, this group down here, which splits the lavender group in half. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, Baxter and Cigar have reconstructed uh, characters that that have an intermediate glide between the vowel and the final k. So instead of having just ak, they have ak and auk. Uh, these reconstructions would not have been sensitive to the regular expression, or the distinction between these reconstructions would not have been sensitive to the regular expression that was supposed to extract the nuclear vowel. And so both of them would have been considered ak finals. Uh, but in fact, they are substantially different in terms of the rhyme structure because uh, what we find is a general pattern, for example, in these, for the alk characters to rhyme with the uh, ok characters, and not for alk characters to rhyme with ak characters. Um, that was probably the most uh, kind of uh, the the most. Uh, scientific, uh, not scientific, the most sort of eureka moment of these uh, rhyme network drawings. But at the same time, uh, it is the discovery of only one additional uh, rhyme category, uh, rhyme category correspondence, I guess you might call it, 
uh, uh, and so I'm, surely there are others, uh, but we would need to do more final slices and uh, a, more reconstructions, I think, in order to figure out where all of these might be. Um, so if we look at cluster quality for final K, uh, what we see is that Wang Li's partition still outperforms OCNR by quite a lot, although the graph that is generated by OCNR has a much higher maximum modularity. Uh, but this is generated with, I believe, um, 15 communities, uh, which makes it not quite as valuable. This is probably a statistical artifact. Um, and if you only measure the vowels that are contained within OCNR, uh, excluding the characters that do not have reconstructions, uh, you only get up to 0.647, including with uh, Sheisheng. Now, Sheisheng makes more of a difference to OCNR than it does to Wang Li in this case. Um, Wang Li's is included, or Wang Li's uh, modularity is it increased by 0 0.08, uh, whereas OCNR is included by 0 0.16. Uh, and the maximum modularity of the Wang Li graph is also a little bit lower, but you get a number from the number of communities that is heuristically calculated that's a little bit closer. Uh, I think in that case, it was eight or it was nine uh, communities, because it tends to be the case that these graphs uh, also partition, uh, for example, uh, these communities uh, or partitions these clusters that are extensions of communities as separate, not as belonging to their own vowel groups. Um, so here is the here are some annotations of what exactly or which vowels correspond to which groups on the Wang Li structure overlaid with the Baxter and Cigar reconstructions, uh, where we see that uh, OCNR mixes Elk and Ilk here uh, with this one yellow character uh, combined with the orange ones. The rest of the Ik characters are in this arc at the top, the yellow arc at the top. Uh, we have Ok and Auk combined here, where Ok characters in Wang Li often correspond to Auk characters in OCNR, uh, and those combine with Ek in OCNR. So interestingly, there's an additional rhyme correspondence between Ek and Auk in OCNR. Um, or ok and ek also in Wangli, uh, which is distinct from ak. Uh, and this is probably the next thing to investigate as far as uh, an additional rhyme correspondence is concerned. Um, so what have we found? Well, among other things, we found that uh, it is difficult to compare rhyme annotations when they're substantially different from each other. Uh, but what we have found is a strong evidence for an additional rhyme preference uh, in final ok syllables, that they may not correspond most strongly with the syllables that share their vowel, but instead with a different category. Um, the evidence is mixed overall for which reconstruction system is better if we take the rhyme annotations to be separate from the reconstructions, then the evidence for Wang Li is a little bit stronger. But uh, at the same time, as far as evidence for reconstructions, uh, if we account for uh, typological evidence and uh, other things or uh, other uh, phonological characteristics, then it certainly seems to be the case that OCNR is closer, at least to a natural language. Uh, although to it, you know, it it might not be correspondent to Old Chinese. Uh, and then some Baxter Cigar characters, particularly in final K, do not merge with major clusters even after imputation. Uh, and this may be a call to do a few different things. So one of them is uh, lack of corpus data, which is an easy problem to solve, uh, but tedious because it just needs, it means that we need to code, for example, the chuzi or a similar corpus into a machine readable format. Um, we may need to revisit the state of reconstructions for those characters specifically, um, or uh, we need to revisit the state of Shisheng series and see if there is something else that needs to be done in order to combine characters into series that may not currently be in series or split series that may be currently together in order to bring characters uh, that currently float along the edge into the fold. Um, and that is what I have to say. So, 
yeah, I think it's time for questions. We have eight minutes. You do find a few characters, uh, particularly in Baxter 1992, where if you look at a certain poem where Wang Li and Baxter disagree, um, it seems to be the case that Wang Li's reconstructions are trying to fit into more of a rhyme paradigm. Uh, Baxter will create the reconstructions uh, and then assign the rhymes. But at the same time, if you look at which reconstructions are supposed to rhyme with each other, sometimes, honestly, they don't make a lot of sense. If I can paraphrase that broadly, it, it seems like uh, Baxter, um, his reconstruction is more motivated by the internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese that then he applies to the analysis of rhyme in the Shijing. Yeah. Whereas Wang Li was using a more circular approach, where, where or let's say spiral approach to not, to make it not sound uh, insulting, uh, where where he sort of has a reconstruction idea and then he does rhyme annotation, then he changes his reconstruction, then he changes so that there's this kind of convergence between the two. And I think the I, I think doing something like that, unless somehow he managed to stumble on a perfect rhyme annotation of the NG finals, is is the only way you could arrive at a network that is as sort of visually coherent as the one the NG final graph. Do I understand correctly that um, if you use Wong Lee's uh, rhyme analysis for the K finals, yes, you get, you get more structure uh, in this like WK uh, area yeah. than his reconstruction predicts. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So if you overlay the Baxter vowels with the Wang Li rhyme structure, you get a better partition than either of them generated independently. To some extent, they're off in their own worlds with, with NG, where you can say like, well, on the one hand, this one's better in this way, and this one's better in this way. But at least in terms of dividing certain vowels uh, before WK, Baxter and Cigar's proposals are improvements even by Wang Li's standards. Yeah, and you yeah. can see that. I mean, I, I you know I can show you the graphs again if you want, but you can see that if you look at a Wang Li graph, because very often what you find is a single colored vowel group that has a cluster here and then a bridge and then a cluster here mm -hmm. that are all one color. Uh, yeah. Whereas if you overlay the Baxter and cigar vowels onto that, those are then split. Um, yeah. yeah. But because Baxter has a different rhyme annotation, this is yeah. kind of a, an independent verifier. For those of us in the in the Baxter camp, that's pretty good ammunition. Yeah, it says that at least some of Baxter and Cigar's proposals do not come straight out of their heads, but are 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 pointed at even by Wang Li's analysis of the rhymes, which sort of suggests that they're you know part of reality, not part of you know imagination. Yeah, you talk a lot about desirable, desirable, undesirable. So so we're sort of wondering what are your desires? Yeah, and um. And my sense is that uh, it's that if we had an infinite supply of poetry, we would get uh, as many clusters as distinct clusters as we have nuclear vowels. Yeah, and that, and that they would be okay. You might have some little tenuous connections between them, but but basically, the larger the data set, the more modularly distinct you would get uh, clusters and you would have as many as you have nuclear vowels. Is that a, a fair characterization of your desire? Yeah. So ideally, you know, if you have, if you slice a graph so that you're only looking at one final and you have seven vowels, uh, ideally no node would remain unconnected to its home group. The, the amount that they are connected within themselves is, you know, is, is to a certain extent, uh, variable because uh, the maximum modularity depends on other factors of the graph, like how many nodes there are and how much on average each node connects to another node and stuff like that. While we're talking about undesirable, you can also talk about undecidable because maybe a, a context-free rhyme annotator cannot predict all possible rhymes. That's a Chomskyan joke for anyone who's out there. What you've just emphasized is that you hate singletons more than you like dense clusters. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's that's how we want reality to be if we had enough data. But you can get there just purely artificially, right? Like 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 I could just I could just take all these nodes and say, mm, here's a real nice partition that just had no correspondence with uh, uh, historical Chinese phonology, and there's no reason 
that, for example, the extent to which Wong Lee's uh, analysis gives him more desirable clusters by your measure, uh, th 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 that we don't know whether that's because he, he's better reflecting the truth or because he's a better magician. That's true. Um, so for that, I would say uh, it would be better to take a look at as many um, as many finals uh, as many final sliced graphs as possible, and then, I mean, my 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 instinct is uh, at that point to philologically look at the bridges between clusters uh, and see where those tend to happen. This is a place where adding other corpora would be important. We know this corpus is the one that was scrutinized while making the reconstruction. So we would anticipate that to the extent that he's a magician, that analysis will fail on another corpus. Yeah, that's, that's right. To which it's reality, it will work nicely on another corpus.